Parasite Eve was one of the first few PlayStation RPGs I had the pleasure of watching. It was far from the typical fantasy setting I had grown accustomed to. It was set in modern day New York, it had guns, creepy mutating monsters. It was like if Resident Evil had become a JRPG. It was awesome and meshed my two favorite genres together. For this analysis, I'm going to cover Parasite Eve, Parasite Eve 2, and The Third Birthday. In a game analysis first, I'm also going to be including the book and the movie of the same name, Parasite Eve, to flesh out the background story to the first game while slowly descending into the weird nonsensical shit that is the third birthday. I chose not to include the official manga, as one series is a recap on the first game and the other explains the movie to western audiences since its existence wasn't really known to gamers. The video will look something like this. The story of Parasite Eve the book, Parasite Eve film, Parasite Eve game, Parasite Eve 2, the third birthday, with themes on evolution, the environment, humanity, identity, and motherhood. There will also be theories and connections, the science section called mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, fun facts, and of course the conclusion. Alright, now that you know what to expect, let's start. Kiyomi Nagashima is a woman who has had some strange dreams, ranging from slithering around with no limbs to splitting her body in half. This weird experience only seems to happen on Christmas Eve. Unfortunately, when we tune into Kiyomi's vision, she is behind the wheel of a car, and when she finishes her dream, she, unsurprisingly, runs her car into a telephone pole. We switch to Toshiaki Nagashima, the husband of the now deceased Kiyomi, a teacher at the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Cue the attractive student, Sachiko Asakura, who is described in fairly precise detail in that her height is 5 foot 9, only an inch shorter than Toshiaki, that she removed her white summer sweater and put on a lab coat, you get it, she's the sexy girl. Then there's a phone call regarding Toshiaki's wife and her accident. Toshiaki goes to the hospital and must wait as Kiyomi has been taken to the operating room. Her parents arrive, 30 minutes later the doctor comes out saying she is heading towards the path of brain death and that she's been put in a coma. Suddenly Toshiaki experiences a strange heat, as though his body was on fire. Before he could be consumed by this random temperature increase, he is brought back to the situation as Kiyomi's parents ask the doctor questions. While he is upset by his wife's eventual death, he can't stop thinking about that heat. After spending a late night at the hospital, Toshiaki goes to the university that he works at and sits in his lab, flashing back to Kiyomi's comatose face now and again. His mind has accepted her brain death, but then he went on to think about her organs and if they could be used for those in need of them. He then remembered she had registered to donate her kidneys. This spirals into what seems like a nice moment into a bit of a psychotic obsession, with Toshiaki coming up with a plan that isn't described to the reader but involves organs, a red indicator fluid in a flask, an old surgeon friend, and the doctor's approval for the plan. Toshiaki yells out in excitement, gets into his car, and tears down the street towards the hospital. This crazed sequence of thoughts and actions bring us to the chapter ending with him saying, from now on my dear, We'll always be together. At the hospital, Toshiaki and Kiyomi's parents approve the kidney donation. During the explanation of said kidney removal, Toshiaki experiences that heat again, and during his fever, he manages to catch the doctor and ask in exchange for Kiyomi's kidneys being taken, he wanted her liver. You know, a totally normal request. Kunio Shinohara, the old surgeon friend of Toshiaki, is finishing up his duties at his ward in the Department of Surgery when he gets a call from Toshiaki. At first, he's delighted to hear from an old friend, and then the conversation goes straight into crazy with Toshiaki. Toshiaki announcing Kiyomi's death and asking his friend to extract her cells from her liver, as he did his dissertation about liver cells and cancer. Shinohara is clearly confused by his friend insisting about this liver cell extraction. We are now introduced to Mariko Anzai, the girl who will be getting one of Kiyomi's kidneys. She tells her dad after he gets home from work and yay, good news all around, except Mariko doesn't exactly like the idea of having a kidney transplanted from a corpse into her, which makes sense because she's like 14 years old. The novel then gets a bit wordy and details about how transplants work and classes and statistics on Japanese registered kidney donors. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea what's going on. 
Eventually, Kiyomi dies, but before that, we get a peek into her obsession with Toshiaki. That he was the only human being that could appreciate and understand who she truly was. She refused to let go of such perfection. She would become one with him. The kidneys are taken from Kiyomi's body and taken to Mariko Anzai and some nobody. Toshiaki, getting more and more crazy, stands at the door as they're taking the kidneys to those receiving them. One of the other doctors explains that Toshiaki wants her liver, and they're like, what the fuck? But since Toshiaki contacted his friend Shinohara earlier, he gets him to do the deed and secure her liver. His friend is clearly worried about him and asks if he should stay with Kiyomi's body to be, you know, with her. With Toshiaki replying with, don't be mistaken, Kiyomi isn't dead yet. More detailed clinical stuff ensues, and the doctor doing the transplant suddenly feels a scorching heat on him after finishing. Hmm. Remember the sexy student, Sachiko Asakura? Well, Toshiaki runs into her with the ice box containing his wife's liver. She is clearly suspicious of this, but he just says he needs to use the cultivation room and wants to get out of her sight. She starts questioning him about his wife, but he just barges past and starts working right away. Lots of science happens, and he manages to check the cells under a microscope, finding that they're glowing against an orange background. He thinks they're beautiful, that she is still alive in these cells, basically letting out an orgasmic sigh knowing that he kind of saved her. She starts getting the hots for Toshiaki, adopting the feelings Kiyomi had for him. She continues to say that she must use him more, hinting that she's probably influencing Toshiaki's craziness and obsession over his wife's cells so that she may continue to live. A funeral service is held for Kiyomi and Sachiko attended. She keeps watching her teacher, Toshiaki, noting that he was acting strange, coming to the lab at strange hours, labeling new cultures that he's been working on as Eve. During his closing statements, Toshiaki delivers a few deadpan lines, but is excited to announce that Kiyomi is still alive in the form of kidney transplants, but as Sachiko observed, he meant something else by those words. Over to Mariko, the teenager who's receiving one of Kiyomi's kidneys, who says that the new organ feels strange. She's running a high fever, which is normal after surgery, but we as the readers know something's up. Later on, she feels as though the kidney is beating, like a heart. Cue father-daughter drama saying to dad, You want this transplant to fail, don't you? So fucking harsh. She calms down after twisting her draining tube and causes herself horrible pain. She continues to have this reoccurring dream where she's in a dark room with eerie footsteps echoing. But this one goes a bit further with the doorknob of the room turning and opening slightly as she wakes up. Back to Psycho Husbando and Sexy Student, they run into each other in the lab, which makes sense as Sachiko is finishing up her papers to graduate and, well, he's her professor. She mentions her work and also says she had to transpose the cultured cells Toshiaki was working on, making him have an inner freakout. But other students start to pour in and it diffuses the tension. Toshiaki tries to get permission to visit Mariko, but thankfully due to patient privacy laws, he cannot. He hangs up the phone and continues to study the cells he has. To his surprise, the cells have increased, which is strange for liver cells which don't multiply much. He suspects the cells might have some cancer-related genes in order to multiply so rapidly. This is the first time he mentions the mitochondria had possibly changed. Back over to father-daughter drama time, we learn that Mariko is suffering from spasms. We also learn that the other recipient of Kiyomi's kidneys has had accelerated rejection to the kidney. Seems like shit isn't going too well. Back at the crazy lab, Toshiaki successfully clones Eve, naming the batch Eve 1. After some more wordy science jargon, we learn that the mitochondria in this batch of cells were expansive and fused together in a vast advanced network. Toshiaki does more science stuff and double confirms that yes, the mitochondria are increasing and is going under some dramatic changes. That the cells had some strange propagative capabilities, suggesting a change in gene linking proteins. Toshiaki takes this new discovery and ropes Sachiko into his experiment, getting her to extract the mRNA from the Eve cells. She is obviously suspicious and questions where the hell these cells are from, with Toshiaki lying and saying he got them from another university lab. She smells bullshit, but does what he asks. We have a montage of Toshiaki's past where he discovered his love for DNA, and that he was encouraged to focus on studying mitochondria. How convenient. Flash forward and we're into August. The students of the university are on break, except for Toshiaki's second student, Sachiko, who is now working closely with the Eve 1 batch. As they work on the experiment, Toshiaki gets a science magazine called Nature, and is pleased to see his article was published alongside Sachiko and his professor friend, Ishihara. Of course, it's about mitochondria, and of course, mentions their little project that they're working on. Cue some random fireworks that make them take a break and celebrate. Flashback time. We get to see Kiyomi meet Toshiaki for the first time at a university party, where he mentions he's researching mitochondria, which causes Kiyomi's heart to leap. Strange, seeing as she probably heard 
heard that word at some point in her life. Anyway, she brushes it off as being drunk, and Toshiaki goes full-blown science nerd on her. I guess this wins her over somehow? Though I think Eve had a huge part in this attraction. Back to Mariko Anzai, the kidney receiver teen, who hasn't spoken to her dad in 10 days. She continues to have nightmares and is generally miserable. Her father is equally depressing, giving light to their strange relationship in the form of he was always working, never opened up much, shit dad who spent more time on business than family. Wife died when they bought their first home and he was still never around. Even when her kidneys failed and she had to go to the hospital for dialysis, he was hardly around. He got angry that a colleague suggested he give Mariko one of his kidneys and thought that it was absolutely abhorrent. And only now he starts to think that maybe that's why she started to hate him. Great dad. We have another flashback of Kiyomi learning more about mitochondria, chatting with Professor Ichihara, spewing stuff the reader already knows about mitochondria at this point. She has her heartbeat go nuts at Toshiaki's name and passes out. More research happens on Eve 1. It is interrupted as Sachiko has a presentation to prepare and Toshiaki feels bad for neglecting his job as her professor and mentor. Rightfully so. They put off the Eve 1 research, but only just a little bit before Toshiaki, obsessed as he is, looks at it and starts hearing a buzzing sound, slowly increasing in volume. The droning sound gets louder and louder before discovering the cultivation liquid holding Eve 1 is rippling, simulating breathing. He sees the colony of cells pulsating like a heart. It had become its own life form. It starts multiplying much faster now, rapidly changing form and eventually forming a human face somehow. It's Kiyomi's face. Then it speaks his name. Things are going real fast now. This whole thing disappears when he feels someone has been watching him yell at the cell culture. Kiyomi, it's me! I can hear you, Kiyomi! Can you hear my voice? And like any sane person, whoever had witnessed it ran away. Another flashback starring Kiyomi brings her to meet Toshiaki again. This time, they start a relationship and Eve speaks from within Kiyomi, saying that he is the one I've been waiting for. And Kiyomi screams, but somehow doesn't make Toshiaki think she's crazy. Over in plot B, Mariko's kidney isn't going so well. It is slightly rejecting her, or so they think. We know what's going on. They get scan results back of Mariko's kidney, and they begin to see some anomalies, with the most obvious one being that the mitochondria in the kidney cells were deformed, larger than normal, extensive networks of proteins, what seems like a heartbeat from the kidney, all the things Toshiaki had examined before. Uh oh. We then get a description of sex from Eve's point of view through Kiyomi's body with Toshiaki. It's fucking weird. Though she slams him for being inexperienced and unskilled, which is kind of entertaining. Then we learn that Eve somehow manipulated Kiyomi's body to reflect Toshiaki's ideal woman, altering her face being one of many things. We get back to Sachiko who's working away on her presentation and decides to take a break, so the book can describe what drinking a cold drink is like. She works on into the night, finding the lab becoming creepier in the evening, and then her spidey senses start tingling, which turns into a sharp pain. Sachiko immediately blames Eve 1, the sample. She starts hearing something moving and dragging in the cultivation room, described as a moist, formless sound like a large, damp mass falling onto the floor. Sachiko freaks out, dropping her cup and alerting HER, aka Eve. Sachiko hides and Eve moves into the hallway. Unfortunately, something spooks Sachiko and she screams, alerting Eve, who turns on all the lights. This shows that this blob sample has intelligence. As Eve rummages through the fridge, Sachiko takes the opportunity to sneak to the door and then book it, but she crawls onto her broken cup and pierces her knee with a shard, alerting Eve, who grabs her and dives into her mouth. Oh crap. There's a long section about Kiyomi on Christmas Eve, living the married life, but also struggling with Eve's growing strength. Kiyomi finally understands that there is something inside her trying to steal Toshiaki from her, something that is completely obsessed with the word mitochondria. Back to Sachiko doing her presentation on a topic I have no clue what it's about. Like most science parts in this book, it will completely lose any normal reader. Toshiaki notes that Sachiko had completed the presentation in record time, witnessing her come into the lab early and leaving late without showing any signs of exhaustion. Her presentation skills were flawless and, well, Toshiaki started to notice that she's becoming more and more beautiful, beyond recognition almost. Oh crap. Flashback to Kiyomi suddenly announcing she wants to register as a kidney donor. When questioned by Toshiaki later, she doesn't remember saying that. Then suddenly, words came out of her mouth that weren't her own that asked, so how do I register? Later on, Kiyomi definitely feels Eve controlling her much, much more often, and she's understandably scared. She attends a lecture and Eve pushes through to ridicule Professor Ishihara on his study stating that mitochondria are slaves to the nuclei. After that, she continues on with her life. The story slowly makes a full circle as it sets up Kiyomi driving and then losing 
losing consciousness. Mariko plot time. Shit gets serious as Mariko is found kicking and screaming as her abdomen rises up and down, like a net full of fish. Great description, sad dad. Nurses come in, things calm down, dad is told to go home. Toshiaki runs into his friend Shinohara, who asks about Kiyomi's liver cells and tells him to fucking stop, and regrets helping him get the sample in the first place. He says Toshiaki shouldn't tamper with Kiyomi's memories, then invites him for a drink after Sachiko's presentation. As said presentation starts, Toshiaki notices his student go from nervous wreck to confident with strange quickness. He definitely feels something is wrong, which is quickly addressed when Sachigo says, At long last, the day has come for mitochondria to break free. Oh crap. She goes on to talk about mitochondrial Eve, DNA, enzymes, nuclear geomes. When the chairman tries to interfere, he clenches his chest as he grows hot, eventually falling to the ground, convulsing and frothing at the mouth. Possessed Sachiko continues to explain that evolution will begin, that they will become new life forms, a perfect species, blah blah blah. Toshiaki then realizes who's actually talking. It's Eve 1. Toshiaki screams for her to stop, resulting in her tempting him with Kiyomi's voice, but he resists and asks for her to release Sachiko's body. Surprisingly, she does. Eve comes out of Sachiko's throat as a glittering liquid, with octopus-like tentacles coming out to restrain Sachiko from clawing at her throat. Then, and I quote, some shiny amorphous meat creature comes out of her body. She then asks for help before bursting into flames. Toshiaki leaps onto Sachiko to help put out the flames with his blazer. Eventually, the sprinkler system kicks in and he passes out. When he wakes up, he's on a stretcher and Sachiko is a charred mess but still alive. Toshiaki barrels towards the university lab where he finds massive massive lumps of flesh, and a vapor that smells like the cultural medium. The Eve blob sees Toshiaki and morphs into Kiyomi's face. Slowly, her body is recreated from the Eve flesh lumps as she tries to seduce Toshiaki, but he's not buying it, calling the desperate look on Kiyomi's face one of a true slut desperately lusting after a man. Before Toshiaki falls for the thirsty bitch, he runs away, but she pursues. Eventually, she pins him down and rapes him. The poor dude describes her body on his like acid melting away his flesh. When he comes to, bits of Eve are everywhere, slowly dying. Which is good, but then Toshiaki realizes she wanted his sperm and planned on birthing a child. That's bad. But Eve needs a womb that would accept such a monster baby. We now shift over to plot B as Toshiaki hears a sound gurgling in the sink. Oh crap. Mariko senses something. Her kidneys feel as though they're moving and they're really hot. Toshiaki, meanwhile, calls the hospital and is trying to warn Mariko, but the policy disallows any contact. He starts going full crazy, desperate to warn them about what's happening. He slams the phone down and gets ready to gun it to the hospital, knowing full well that Eve went down the sink drain and can travel to the recipient in no time. Sad Dad is sitting in the lobby of the hospital, not wanting to go home, but also not wanting to cause any trouble by staying past visiting hours. A nurse comes and tells him to go, and as he leaves, he notices is a manhole covering clattering around as something rolled on past from the sewers. He realizes that it's going towards the hospital and worries for his daughter. Oh crap causing him to rush back through the side entrance he came from. Mariko starts mimicking the exorcist and is bouncing up and down on the bed, her abdomen swelling like a balloon. As this chaos unfolds, it suddenly stops. They think it's over, but it isn't. Mariko's eyes shoot open and stare at the sink in the room. Oh crap. A big drip forms and grows and grows, falling into the sink with a wet flap. Toshiaki arrives at the hospital, shouting and demanding where the girl is with the kidney. He then meets Mariko's dad. Over to Mariko, she watches the drips begin to gather and form until it explodes forth with all of the Eve blob rushing out. Sad Dad and Toshiaki exchange some quick dialogue and run to Mariko. They find the doctor with his arms on fire, half-naked Mariko, and Blob Eve looking at Kiyomi in the hospital room. Eve grins and takes Mariko, smashing through the glass and disappearing. Eve finds another hospital, kills a dude, and mounts Mariko, forming a blob dick to deliver the fertilized egg into Mariko. Yep, Eve rapes the poor girl. Toshiaki and Sad Dad get to where Eve is, but not before Toshiaki has a dumb thought saying, am I gonna have a child with mitochondria? When they find Eve, she is already decomposing, but she is one. Mariko's stomach then heaves as the child super quickly grows. Insert graphic birth description. As the baby crawls on the ground, it starts to grow very quickly, eventually turning into the sexiest woman alive. Just as she's about to kill off everyone with her massive power trip, this Eve child begins to shift into a man. Basically, female and male mitochondria are at war? She is then reduced to a decaying organic heap on the floor. Toshiaki and Eve child embrace and fuse into one, both dying in the process. Sad Dad and Mariko survive, with Mariko feeling one final thump from the kidney pulse before it being fully assimilated to her body. Sachiko finishes up her master's degree in pharmaceutical sciences and then does a whole science dump on DNA to sweep up any loose ends regarding mitochondria. Her attention is then brought to other Eve samples, which she quickly takes and destroys them in an autoclave, a machine that uses steam pressure to kill the samples.
So basically take everything I said about the book and shove it into a film. Except, wait a minute, crank up the romance and leave out some of the cool horror moments. That's what fans of Parasite Eve want, right? Overall, the film is pretty dull, seeing as they focused on the weaker aspect of the novel. That and it takes place in labs, hospitals, a pharmacy school, so the scenery isn't really going to change much. So were there any major plot changes from the film? In the novel, Mariko is raped by Eve and does give birth to the ultimate being. Seeing as the rest of the movie is pretty tame, putting the whole rape scene in would probably be a bit too disturbing for people and would most likely cause the age rating to skyrocket. So instead, Eve is just, you know, preparing for the birth. Instead of Toshiaki and Child Eve fusing into a gross blob, he and Eve, in the image of his wife, embrace and are set on fire, both dying in the end. I will say, I'm very glad they dumbed down the science talk a whole lot. The game opens up to New York, 1997, Christmas Eve. Enter Aya Brea, age 25, occupation, NYPD officer, who is attending an opera at the Carnegie Hall with a shitty date. As the couple watch the opera unfold, the lead actress takes center stage and sings. That's when we get a creepy stare from her towards Aya before people start to spontaneously combust and fires crop up everywhere. The actress is surprisingly chill about this whole development despite the raging inferno behind her. Aya enters cop mode and ditches her date in a satisfying way. She confronts the actress who is now levitating and tells Aya to listen to her cells. Understandably, Aya starts shooting this crazy bitch. During the fight, Aya begins to feel the heat. Her body is getting hot, but doesn't erupt into flames, thankfully. When asked, the woman says her name is Eve and is surprised that Aya doesn't know who she is. After some more confusing nonsense from the floating woman, Aya starts to have flashbacks of a hospital bed showing a little girl. Possibly her, we don't know. The actress pieces out, and Aya pursues. After shattering her ankles from jumping down a hole with high heels, Aya sees a small girl who laughs when she tells her to get out of here, and disappears. Aya seems to recognize the ghost girl, but disregards it and starts seeking out the actress. As she runs through the halls, Aya is greeted with a gruesome and super awesome mutating rat that transforms into a large, raptor-sounding creature. She is rightfully freaked out, thinking that Eve was the one who did this. Aya finds a crispy victim, still alive, and learns the actress calling herself Eve is actually Melissa. Aya eventually finds a diary belonging to said Melissa, and reads about her reliance on medication and her desperation to get the lead role in the opera. It also mentions that Melissa's rival, Suzanne, had her apartment set on fire, and that there is a concert taking place in the park the next day. Hint, hint. Aya concludes that Melissa has a drug problem, and takes the key found in the diary to confront Eve, aka Melissa. Not even she knows who she really is anymore. Melissa mutates further and laughs, initiating part two of the unfinished boss fight. After the fight, Eve drops the mitochondria plot word, and Aya flashes back to the hospital bed again. This time, a doctor is present. But who is it? When Aya comes to, Eve has gone down a not-so-obvious hole in the floor, which leads to the sewers. Thankfully, she didn't get too far, but Aya starts to feel hot again. Eve is suspicious of Aya and how she hasn't been affected like the others, but skips out on actually telling poor, confused Aya about what makes her so special. Instead, she turns into some goo and and phases through the sewer grating, playfully fucking off before a crocodile with electric fangs appears for a fight. After emerging from the depths of Carnegie Hall, Aya is pounced on by some annoying reporters who are keen to whip up the idea of a cult enthusiast being behind this. A man casually walks up and almost murders the guy with a direct punch to the face. Aya name drops the guy as Daniel, her fellow officer and partner, who then travels at light speed to take her home after she falls asleep. 
The next day, Aya is back at work with her co-workers harassing her about the incident and cooking up their own wild theories on the whole matter. Aya is then called to Baker's office, the chief, who then allows her to get a better weapon. Aya then runs into a boy that looks like he's wearing a dressing gown, who is quickly called upon by Daniel as Ben, his son. Daniel forgets he promised to go to the park concert and says work has gotten busy. Ben is obviously upset and runs off. Back in Baker's office, boss man wants Aya to be present at the press conference and tells her to shut up and don't say anything that would make her sound crazy. During the conference, Aya doesn't shut up and sounds absolutely batshit crazy. Talking about mitochondria, name dropping Eve, and that the actress Melissa is dead because Eve took over her body. The conference wraps up quickly and Baker is pissed that Aya said all that nonsense as it would only stir up panic. He's interrupted by a phone call and explains that a Japanese scientist wants to meet him and talk about might o or mitochondria. Nix, one of Aya's co-workers, inserts his high school biology knowledge into the game and gets everyone wondering. He then mentions that a researcher at the museum had recently wrote a new theory about mitochondria. Aya and Daniel blaze straight towards the museum at more breakneck speeds, while making fun of the researcher named Dr. Clamp and discussing why Daniel kisses Baker's ass all the time. When they arrive, they chat up the guard and gain access, find the researcher on his seizure-inducing computer who is super absorbed in his studies. When he finally turns around, Aya has an unwanted flashback that she is super annoyed to have. She then thinks Clamp is the doctor in her flashbacks. After the headache, Aya and Daniel get right into telling Clamp about all the crazy shit Eve said. He laughs at them and says they have no idea what true mitochondria is like. Do you? Now get ready for some science-y plot bullet points. Mitochondria has its own unique genetic code. Clamp claims it is a separate organism. Humans cannot live without mitochondria. It creates energy. Mitochondria is capable of discharging 200,000 volts of electricity. This applies to heat energy too. Mitochondria running at full could melt someone. Mitochondria has control over an organism's growth. It can mutate 10 times faster than normal cells. Since the beginning of creation, the mitochondria have been evolving at this rate. And of course, he touches on mitochondrial Eve. Dr. Clamp then stops going on about his random bullshit that may or may not be true, and is surprised that Aya mentions that the woman she confronted called herself Eve. He then returns to his studies and ignores them. Blasting through the streets of Manhattan like 2001, A Space Odyssey, Aya recognizes Clamp but can't pinpoint him, despite us, as the player, fully understanding her flashback. Daniel ignores her and answers the radio in the car, realizes they have a lead, and drives even faster somehow. Back at the station, the officers have a meeting. They know Melissa was scheduled to have a concert this day, in the park, as mentioned in her diary. Baker says that they have to prevent another massacre. Daniel freaks out when he hears this information, knowing that his ex-wife and son Ben are going to be at that concert. Cue the CG cutscene for the fast police car. They arrive at the park, Daniel does the reckless dad thing and stomps forward, his arm igniting from Eve's influence. Aya volunteers to go in and find Ben, who hopefully isn't fried to a crisp, seeing as Daniel caught on fire. Aya eventually gets to the amphitheater that is full of people with Eve floating at the center of the stage with normal human hands this time. She announced is that mitochondria's time to take over is now. She has her cells communicate with the audience, who all melt into a big pile of ooze and it moves off. Aya gets down to confront Eve, asking her why she's doing this, only for her to float off, telling Aya to basically piss off and stop ruining her plans. After following the ghost girl through a maze of pathways and fighting giant worms, Aya eventually makes it to Eve, who is in a carriage, except she's not because she's totally floating, but whatever. She invites Aya for a ride, and she stupidly accepts instead of shooting her. The horse is set on fire, and the crazy boss ride fight begins. Eve tries to convince Aya to side with mitochondria, but fails, opting for a more direct approach to Aya Aya's missing memories. Eve reaches out her hand and Aya experiences more of the same flashback as the carriage crashes to a halt. Daniel is reunited with Ben, who avoided the whole disaster because he was trying to find his dad. The two of them question where Aya is, pan over to the NYPD that are determined not to let anyone else die, and, you know, mentioning that Aya is still missing. Daniel stubbornly goes out to search for her while entrusting Ben to Kathy, one of the officers who introduces him to the next boss fight. Shiva, a police dog. New York is evacuated with insane promptness except for some racist cops. Q Maeda, that Japanese scientist mentioned earlier on the phone. Cop B immediately asks if he's Chinese, starts speaking in Japanese randomly, and then back to Cop A for the get out my country line, and then experiences instant karma. Kunihiku Maeda takes this opportunity to get through the police barricade and fucks right off. Back to Aya, we see more hospital
additional images. A hallway with lockers, a front reception area, the outside entrance. She then wakes up in a random house with Maeda for some reason, who is sitting watching TV with a roaring fire in a barrel. I hope this room is ventilated. Aya is like, who the fuck are you? Maeda introduces himself while Daniel finishes up his sentence saying he found her. Maeda listens in to Aya's explanation that the audience melted into a pile of goop, and he casually mentions that something similar happened in Japan. And this is where the book plot is neatly inserted into the game. Aya starts to have a mental breakdown, thinking that she may be some monster like Eve because she isn't affected by her powers, and that she might end up killing those around her. She ends up telling them to go away, and they give her some time to rest. Daniel reassures her she isn't a monster, giving her his fatherly support before leaving. When alone, Aya starts wondering if Eve is Maya, her sister that died in a car crash with her mum. As Aya emerges from the random house, she finds Maeda outside in the cold with Daniel rocking up in a police car, saying that there's no traffic, as if that affected his insane speeding before. After robbing some stores, with Daniel recklessly shooting a door open, with Aya standing right beside it, the team then barrels down the road towards the museum as Maeda wants to access a research facility and conduct a test for plot reasons. Once there, he shows Aya some sweet CG cells under an insanely good microscope being attacked by Eve's infected cells. Maeda suspects the beasts that Aya's been fighting have been affected in a similar way. He also points out some basic biological information on how mitochondria work, and that Eve's mitochondria have evolved so that it doesn't need to rely on the cell's nucleus that tells it what to do. It's gone rogue! Aya then pipes up and asks him to test her cells on Eve's, wanting to know why she can repel her mitochondria mutations. We get another CG scene, but this time, the attacking cells are being shocked and repelled by Aya's cells. Maeda explains that Eve wants to destroy all other mitochondria, but Aya's have adapted to rebel against that destruction. The conversation is cut short as Dr. Clamp walks in. Daniel is quick to point out that he should have evacuated, but he doesn't give a shit. Unfortunately, the weasel sees Aya's cells and demands to know where they came from. Maeda says he doesn't know, but somehow Clamp knows their Ayas. He starts grilling her, but Daniel notices a list on Clamp's computer that lists his ex-wife and son's name. He gets understandably angry and threatens Clamp. They all get kicked out and the gang return to the precinct, entering hyperspace as they do so. During their lightspeed space travel, Maeda notes that the list Daniel saw was a human leukocytes antigens list, or an HLA type list, basically to see if your body will reject donated organs. Daniel books it to the station that's, oh whoops, it was visited by Eve and is now fucked. Maeda gives you a stupid charm that takes up an item slot, and as you investigate the building, you learn that Ben ran after Shiva, who is berserk. Cue the sick music to tune in. After Ben follows Shiva into an obvious boss room, Baker takes the kid away from her, and they watch as she transforms into the Cerberus monster. Cue boss music now. Baker fires four shots and is out of bullets, and now has to wait for Aya to save them. When Aya arrives, she faces the giant mutated Shiva as Baker protects Ben. Aya destroys the poor doggo, Baker hobbles off injured, while Daniel takes over as chief. Ben asks Aya to murder whoever did that to Shiva. No problem, kid. That was the plan. Daniel receives the support of the surviving officers and Aya goes to check on Maeda, who's in the police lab. Daniel slowly rocks up and the three of them discuss why Eve attacked the police station. A distraction? From what? What's that? A sperm bank? Eve needs sperm? Birth ultimate being? Oh shit. Better get to the hospital and stop her. Now it's Aya's time to speed. They get to St. Francis Hospital and Maeda gives Aya another item slot stealing charm. Aya goes into the hospital, gets dumped down the elevator shaft, restarts a generator, gets back up to the ground floor, sees the hospital beds in her flashback, has a freak out moment while a nurse just hangs out in the corner of the room, gains access to the liquid nitrogen room that keeps sperm preserved, turns off the valve in that room, finds a really dumb fucking button to open a door, finds patient records on her mom, and the HLA list from earlier, then finds out that Melissa Pierce and Maya were brought into the hospital on the same day and operated on. Hmm. 
switch over to the Navy who are like, should we blow up Manhattan? But the Admiral is like, no, we can't do that yet. So they send in some fighter jets to take care of this monster threatening New York. After fighting a random brain spider on the roof, Eve decides to show up, normal human hand version, and talks about how Eve in the novel failed to birth the ultimate being, but that she wouldn't make the same mistake. Aya implies that Eve is Maya, but she goes off on a tangent, insulting the human race for relying on machines and deciding to obliterate the pilots inside the fighter jets. Eve then pieces out again, and Aya has to avoid a jet crashing onto the roof, which the game gives you no clear indication as to where you need to go or what to do. Aya manages to get to safety with Daniel and Maeda quick to greet her. Speed car! Dude isn't even looking at the goddamn road. Daniel dug out some dirt on Clamp, saying that he was fired for giving out a patient list, and that Melissa was going to the museum late at night. Instead of, you know, going to where Clamp usually is, Daniel decides the team should split up and search for Clamp and Eve, aka shove in another chapter before the final one. Aya is directed to Soho, where she goes through a sewer system and reunites with the audience from Central Park. You know, that memorable pile of goo. It falls into the reservoir, which isn't good, as it could infect the whole city, even though most of the people have evacuated, but shh, it's fine. In the next room, Aya flushes it out, no problem, though it has a tantrum and causes some damage before leaving. Aya then enters the subway, fighting a rotating centipede, runs onto the bridge above to realize, oh my god, Eve is at the museum. Her discovery is so shocking, the game demands disc two. Ah, the museum. What a slog of a dungeon. Anyways, Aya spots Clamp walking along, being all sneaky, loses sight of him, explores the museum while answering quiz questions, jumping down from ledges in a very risky way, fights dinosaurs brought back to life, eventually finding a heavily pregnant Eve who has many boobs and extra arms. She's been growing. For some reason, Aya averts her gun to take a good look at Eve, only to receive more sass from her. Aya approaches Eve, but she calls the giant blob monster from the sewers to come and take her away. Aya reunites with Daniel and Maeda. They speed off into the light of Aya's flashbacks, where Daniel explains that Aya's sister Maya had her kidney transplanted into Melissa, who suffered from kidney failure. The intern at the time, Clamp, took on the operation as the other doctors claimed the kidney was too hot. This brings to light that Maya was originally carrying Eve, and that thanks to Melissa's drug popping, aka taking immunosuppressant drugs, to prevent her body from rejecting the new kidney, Eve was able to take control of her. Back to the Navy officers, the trigger-happy captain wants to destroy shit. Approved! Zoom car! Daniel gets a call in and learns about the Navy's move, which is pretty stupid of them considering what happened only a day earlier. The Jets try and shoot the blob protecting Eve, only to be, you guessed it, completely annihilated. Then suddenly a helicopter lands in the road where the gang are. They ask Aya to come with them to the naval ship. Bam! Welcome to the ship. They get straight to the point. Aya can't be ignited, so take a helicopter and nuke the damn thing. Awesome! Aya is totally game for this shit and heads towards the Statue of Liberty to kill Eve. As the escort choppers approach, they make a formation that guarantees their death due to the blob creature's laser beam. Aya doesn't like this, but hey, the chopper is on autopilot. Too bad. Aya launches the missiles and blows up the ooze. But wait, Eve is still alive, damn it. Time to save the game. Aya parachutes in. Eve tries to pull the whole, humans are the true monsters, mitochondrial rules, we don't need you anymore, losers, before totally eating shit and dying finally after a two-part boss fight like a proper JRPG. Hooray, you did it! Ignore the fact the game showed you a title card saying Day 6 Liberation just now. Oh, and hey! The item storage and weapon guy just so happens to be on the Navy ship for moral support. Not to mention that generous guard who just gave you a load of ammo and medicine for funsies. Before the sappy congratulations can take place, Aya senses something and we start to hear baby noises. The worst kind of monsters in games. Its cries blow up loads of ships and causes complete devastation. Aya understands that this thing must die. Maeda goes to give her something and Daniel stops him, thinking it's his shitty item slot robbing charm again. This slimy brain baby crawls onto the ship, and the final boss fight begins. It shifts from brain baby to teenage emo angel, to crawling corpse with electric wings, to adult with a shit sack strapped to its ass. Just when you thought it wasn't done evolving, it turns into a translucent green fish creature with crystal lasers floating around it. Up in the sky, Maeda is sad that he couldn't give Aya his super bullets to fight the ultimate being. Daniel takes them and does a suicide drop from the helicopter to get the bullets to Aya, igniting into flames and everything in the process. As Aya utterly destroys this thing, she now gets to go through the worst part of the game, a path-specific route where if you take one wrong turn, it's game over and you have to do that final fight all over again. When you get to the engine room, you set it to explode. All the while, this thing is out to get you and will insta-kill you the moment it touches you. Aya manages to escape the exploding ship that finishes off the ultimate being. Thank fucking god.
As the gang look out to the waters, it's explained that Aya received part of Maya herself. She was born with a defective right eye, and so they implanted Maya's cornea into Aya, which explains why she could resist Eve's influence. Maeda says Aya's mitochondria most likely evolved differently compared to Eve's, and thus didn't turn her into a monster. Cue the typical 90s JRPG message of humans destroying the environment and upsetting nature, and then Aya has a dramatic moment looking out to the waters. Fast forward, and we see Aya, Daniel, Maeda, and Ben all go to the opera to make up for the Christmas Eve nightmare. The opera unfolds exactly the same as before, obviously with a different lead actress, but they add some flair, having the guard bring a flaming torch. Seeing as this is fairly recently after the whole Eve thing, probably not a good idea. The gang visibly freak out, but calm down shortly after. As the opera continues, we get a sequence showing Eve's cells being all suspicious and evil, ending with Aya standing up as the audience's eyes glow an eerie reddish purple light. The end. years after the incident in New York, Aya has moved on over to Los Angeles and is now working for the FBI under the MIST division, also known as the Mitochondrian Investigation and Suppression Team. She is an NMC hunter, neo-mitochondrian creatures, and the game starts with Aya at a shooting range with her co-worker Pierce Carradine. Soon after, Aya is instructed to go to the Acropolis Tower by her boss, supervising agent Hal Baldwin. Aya is reluctant, joking that the last time there was a creature sighting, it was just some dude dressed as a chicken. Now get used to this sass from Aya. Her sass meter is off the chain in this game. Eventually, Aya heads out in her car, Carrie, and arrives to see a helicopter crash and blow up a load of cars. The amount of shits Aya does not give is amazing. The game pulls you through a trippy camera shifting scene that is hard to navigate with tank controls and brings Aya to the front of the tower. The situation is that the SWAT team went in 10 minutes ago, and then silence. All civilians have been evacuated, oh and people are yelling about creatures. Once in the tower, it's clear things are not alright. The SWAT team has been massacred, and those that are still alive are being mauled by some weird humanoid monster things. Aya eventually gets called by a payphone, where Baldwin is on the other side asking about the situation. Aya finds another surviving SWAT member, who tells her about a civilian that didn't evacuate in the cafeteria. In the cafeteria, it turns out the woman is a monster, shifting into what Aya fought earlier. Monsters sound like horses, by the way. After dealing with the creature, Aya finds an implant of some kind behind the thing's ears. Suddenly, the monster starts getting up behind Aya, but thank god Rupert Broderick comes in to thoroughly kill it. As the monster melts, Aya says it can mimic the human form. Before they can get too deep into what's going on, more of these humanoid horse hissing things turn up to delay the plot a bit. Rupert says to call for backup, then disappears from the cafeteria once you've completed that. As you faff about with cameras, spotting that earlier SWAT member, and locating color coordinating keys, you eventually come across a chapel with gunshots sounding from inside. Here you find Rupert being mounted by a giant soldier thing who quickly escapes through the stained glass windows above. Rupert says to pursue it, and I begrudgingly agrees. After some bullshit Resident Evil puzzles, because this game so desperately wants to be resi, you find a remote bomb as you make your way up to the helipad. As you go to the elevator to said helipad, Aya has the genius idea to run all the way back to Rupert and tell him that the weirdo soldier might flee on a helicopter. But oh no, the crazy soldier stops Aya from backtracking too much. Darn. The soldier threatens Aya with a remote detonator, sets his machete on fire, and attacks. After breaking away half of his mask, he jumps up to the helipad. Aya pursues, he leaps across to another building, Rupert rocks up just in time to look at a detonator, only for it to go off because there is apparently another detonator. The two casually wait for the chopper to pick them up, and are rescued in the nick of time.
Ring, ring. We're back in the office with Hal Baldwin. He pulls out a newspaper that has the headline, UFO invasion and aliens ate my spaghetti. Seems like a totally legit source of information. One that you can very much take seriously. Anyways, they pick out the cattle mutilation article and Aya is rightfully skeptical about this whole idea. Aya is given a folder of documents and after reading them, cranks up the sass. I would too. After being dismissed, Aya starts loading up her car and is visibly pissed off about her assignment. Pierce then mentions the implant from the creature that Aya collected. He says it's a microtransmitter and that someone was controlling the creature. He also says that he found sand in it. Conveniently, the sand is from the Mojave Desert where Aya's headed. Pierce then details NMCs were found everywhere except arid areas of the US, which makes this even more bizarre. Aya feels a bit better now that her mission isn't just some UFO bullshit. Aya drives along and arrives in Dryfield, an welcoming desolate place. It doesn't take long for Aya to find NMCs crawling all over the place. After a dull car machine puzzle, Aya finds the only resident in Dryfield right now, who is extremely cautious of Aya's appearance, which makes total sense. Aya asks what's going on, and the man says he'll tell her later. He has to make some rounds. He's at least kind enough to give her the best room in the motel to rest up. He then introduces himself as Douglas. When Aya gives her name, he says it sounds familiar, to which Aya says, nah, it's Japanese, you probably haven't heard of it. In the motel room, Aya goes to the balcony and looks at the water tower in the back. There she sees a dude standing on top and immediately takes the ladder down to help him. After decimating the local creatures and opening an annoying door, Aya eventually meets up with the mysterious man who introduces himself as Kyle Madigan and seems to know a lot about what's going on. He then mentions he's a private investigator looking for the shelter. Aya makes fun of his choice of clothing before addressing the big plot point he just dropped. But Kyle can't say anything about this shelter anyway, but wants to join forces. Aya agrees and they continue to look around Dryfield. As Aya looks from the top of the tower, she spots a red truck, meaning Douglas is back. After finding a reference to an obscure game and doing a frustrating puzzle with a magnet, Aya reunites with Douglas who is now going to sell her some weapons cause the FBI said he should. When asked about the shelter, Douglas mentions a bunker of sorts that a militia group made for nukes and says it's out in the hills. Says a big company bought it a few years ago. Probably means three years ago. How convenient. Just then Aya hears a scream. Honestly, I didn't hear it at all. It's super quiet, but thankfully Aya did. Like the good girl she is, Aya goes to find the source of the scream. Aya locates it, hears some desperate, chilling cries, but can't get to them as they're behind a shelf that's bolted to the wall. Time to backtrack and ask Douglas. You get a wrench from his car shop, go back to the still screaming woman who will soon be dead, open it up, and find Mr. Crazy Soldier again, this time with no mask at all. He then says some suspicious shit that Aya doesn't question, then they fight. After the fight, the Crazy Soldier laughs hysterically saying, You're Eves. Some dramatic heartbeat cuts, some glowing spikes emerge from Aya's back, Soldier is on fire on the floor, then we're treated to a scene with a smaller Aya on an operating table. The lights above break and everything gets a bit distorted. Alarms start sounding, the girl gets up from the table and is heard walking away. It is now nighttime in Dryfield. Aya has been passed out in this empty house for quite some time. Kyle emerges and aims his gun at the unconscious Aya, only to have her wake up and set his hand on fire. Kyle asks what happened, Aya doesn't see the crazy soldier and Kyle has no idea who she's talking about. Kyle then says he found out where the shelter is, even though Aya already heard it from Douglas. He says they need a car and Aya has one. Hooray! And the car is totaled by some armless gremlins. Time to take Douglas's truck. You get some gas for the truck. Douglas says he'll fix it up and tells Aya to rest up in the motel room. Aya experiences some of the visions from this mysterious Aya-like child in the metal bunker of sorts, being chased by mass-produced crazy soldiers. She is awoken by some really annoying TV noise bullshit, but we are then blessed with the famous shower scene that has to exist for some reason. Unfortunately, we're cut off after hearing what seems like an earthquake. Turns out it's some giant flesh blob with a flamethrower for a mouth. Boss fight with elephant noises. Douglas tries to fight it, it doesn't work. Aya takes over and finishes it off. When you check up on him, he's fine. Hands you the keys to his truck, and you're off with Kyle to the shelter. Aya and Kyle barrel through a fence, and we pan up to see some of those puma creatures, noting that there's one huge one among them, probably a future boss fight. The two of them get to the start of some mines. Kyle is wounded, but Aya tells him to go ahead and that she would handle shit. After said shit is handled, Aya proceeds to go through the mines, running into the predicted boss fight moments earlier. She also finds a motorcycle belonging to that crazy soldier. After some electric plug shenanigans, Aya gains access to the shelter, which looks very familiar to all of those Aya child memories. As we explore this vest, 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 
ass. New area, we come across a few files here and there, detailing a Dr. Bowman and his obsession with the experiments done on people and creatures. We now have a name for the crazy soldier too. He is simply called Nine. Eventually, Aya has to escape through a garbage chute and comes to fight the garbage monster that sucks in everything and produces the most annoying laughing enemies in the game. <laughs> The boss then collapses, but doesn't melt. That only means one thing. As you leave, the boss casually walks through the wall and continues the fight. Once the boss finally melts, Aya is greeted by an announcement that the incinerator she is standing in will activate in five minutes. She manages to escape after waiting for the slowest platform elevator to make a path. Reuniting with pixel hunk Kyle Madigan once again. He explains his ultra convenient way of finding the shelter, flirts with Aya, and then accompanies her for less than a minute before going on ahead as Aya checks up on Douglas like a nice lady. Somehow Pierce is in dry field, and after shoving three bags of ice on his wound, he comes around and pulls a Maeda and gives you a lucky charm. Thankfully in this game, this charm is fucking amazing, so thanks Pierce. Eventually Aya goes back and gets through the shelter, finding a computer along the way. She logs in after a weird quiz to access some plot information information. ANMC is artificial neomitochondrial creatures created under the second Neoteny plan. The Neoteny plan harnesses the evolutionary potential of neomitochondria to revitalize the human race. It then nicely breaks itself into stages of how this is being obtained. Stage 1. Find a good sample with latent powers equal to Eve's power from the New York incident. Stage 2. Administer samples to test subjects and rewrite genetic code for experiment fun times. Stage 3. Profit, aka release humanity's true potential. Aya then slowly types in, asking what stage they're at, and so far they have a sample, but only a few ANMCs were successful. Lots were not, but don't worry, they can make more clones from the sample they got from New York. Now the kicker, the test sample is Aya's, so that must mean the clones are Aya's. All of the ANMCs are part of her sample too. Before Aya is too mentally foregone, Pierce rings the nearby phone and tells Aya he's in the shelter too! Twinsies! He tells her to meet him, and so she does. After a couple's quarrel, Pierce goes into detail about why the fuck he's down here. He brings Aya's attention to some cameras, with one showing a tropical forest that is said to be even further underground. It's a greenhouse on a massive scale called the Neo Arc. Down there, something is generating a buttload of energy, creating an electromagnetic barrier of sorts that protects whatever experiments are going on. As Aya goes down to the Neo Arc, we are treated to a scene with the President of the United States. The plot thickens with mention of a mole within the that organization. The president and staff go through some cryptic dialogue that doesn't make any sense, concluding with the Prez granting permission to use that SDI relic, if necessary, and to keep it hush-hush. We then see that the SDI is a laser from space. Continuing with Aya's exploration, we enter Mini Jurassic Park, complete with annoying weird puzzles. After destroying two massive creatures generating electricity, Aya leaves the Neo Arc and uses the other elevator down to a massive subwoofer that is causing Aya some headaches. She eventually runs into Aya Aya Child, who is powering up a massive spindly creature that is easily taken down by some grenades. Before Aya can confront the child, Kyle rocks up to distract her before they dramatically enter the child's room, Kyle aiming his gun while Aya stops him and takes off the child's helmet, revealing an Aya clone. Aya learns that the little girl's name is Eve, because it said so on the helmet. She identifies the helmet as a brainwave amplifier, which can control the other ANMCs. Aya feels for Eve, knowing she was mind-controlled and brutally treated. Soon after, the nine clones come in with gas. Kyle stays behind to fight them while Aya and Eve get the hell out of there. Unfortunately, Eve is captured moments after escaping to the Neo Arc by Nine himself. Aya goes to find Pierce, but he has disappeared but left a note behind explaining that there was a traitor among the Mist crew, and that it was Hal Baldwin. Aya then calls Jody to get her the fuck out of Mist, as Baldwin is maybe gonna kill her? Aya goes to the underground parking lot to escape the shelter now full of nine clones. Thankfully, as she escapes, the military are there to clean up. Go. 
pan back to the president and his cryptic shit. They sent in their boys, but can't access one part of the shelter where the final boss will take place. On to plan D, shoot the shelter from space. But what about withdrawing all those troops they just sent in? Nah, they'll be remembered as heroes. It's fine. Aya briefs the second lieutenant on neo-mitochondria, and he tells her that they weren't able to locate Eve or Nine. When asked if they secured every part of the shelter, he fumbles, saying one area isn't accessible. Guess where Aya's going? Outside the tent, you meet Flint, Douglas's faithful dog, with a reward item, and Jody, who managed to escape Mist in record time, and to inform you that Baldwin was arrested, along with other Mist agents, for supplying NMC genetic information for god knows what. After giving Flint a teddy bear belonging to Eve, he follows Aya into the shelter, where you end up saving a random soldier dude. Hooray! You also find Pierce was locked in a freezer, but thankfully you get him out in time. You know, before the shelter is eventually nuked from orbit. When you get to the section where Eve is, you see Eve, Nine, and Kyle? Nine is pissed off at Aya for ruining all his plans, but he's set on causing mass forced evolution by using Eve and the tentacles caressing her head. Kyle then comes up and explains that his organization is dedicated to guiding the human race, thinking it's unhealthy that humans are dominating the world so hard, and by creating ANMCs to eat humans, makes everything equal and fair, right? Anyways, Kyle shoots Aya point blank, but somehow only grazes her arm. Kyle has a bit of a rant about feeling trapped as a child growing up, being told what to do and criticized for his choices, comparing his stupid child complaint to neo-mitochondria and how it can grow into something good. Nine interrupts his monologue and then Kyle straight up shoots him in the head and stops the blob creature from consuming Eve. How about that? He's actually good. Seems like Kyle has had a change of heart mid-monologue and decided to be on the winning side. Nine gets eaten by the blob to form the second last boss of the game, but before that, Aya forgives Kyle immediately and then BLAM! Orbital Bombardment! what Parasite Eve game wouldn't be complete without a baby boss fight, complete with baby noises. Aya wakes up, Kyle says he's okay, but apparently his leg was shot off, according to the wiki. Eve fell down, Aya goes to find Eve, ends up fighting Mega Baby. After that, Aya creates a bridge to go catch Eve from some pipes. Uh-oh, Baby Tentacle eats her and creates a glowing butterfly, aka Eve. The final boss fight. At the end of the fight, Eve embraces Aya, but then falls apart as she flies up, leaving Aya to fall to her death? Nah, she falls onto a pile of goo where Eve is too. She wakes up hearing Kyle's voice, finds him standing above her. She wants to chat, but no, 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 no. Time to rest. Then he disappears. What a dick. We see the President of the United States and his staff praise Mist for keeping casualties to a minimum. The President himself says they want to invite that hot haunter and her friends, just to, you know, sound awkward and creepy. They then explain that the incident is being covered up by a cultist nuclear attack story, because that won't cause the media to go crazy with speculation. In other words, fake news saves the President. The agent they mentioned before, being a mole of that organization, is heavily hinted to be Kyle Madigan, who has pieced out and disappeared from everyone's radar. Now his sudden exit makes sense. A year after the incident, Aya informs us that most missed traders were arrested or dealt with. The information on the shelter and its organization remains classified. No explanations, and they're not allowed to talk about it. She is pretty pissed off by it all. Rupert takes over Baldwin's position, with Jody helping out. Maeda gets mentioned despite never appearing in the game, proposing a superhuman theory, calculating neomitochondrial latency over a 10-year span, and that its carriers would evolve the human race. Understandably, 
people are not thrilled about this theory. Pierce, however, loves the theory and joins Maeda, helping him look for potential carriers. They want to catch these people first before they transform and cause chaos and reduce the numbers of NMCs emerging. Eve is now Aya's younger sister after Rupert pulled some FBI strings. She's a happy girl at school, plus she lost her neomitochondrial powers. Bonus, Douglas is alive and loves guns and Kyle is missing. Or is he? We are back in New York. It's looking beautiful. It's snowing and... Wait. Wow, what mitochondrial event will we face now? What? Has nothing to do with mitochondria? Oh. Roger that. Here on out, we refer to it as the Babel. We get pulled into a basement with a cryogenic tank thing in the middle. We see feedback from this attack taking place, with Aya Brea wincing at the images. You'd think she would be used to this kind of shit by now. We are then introduced to an evil-sounding dude, with an equally evil-sounding name, Hyde Bohr, chief of the CTI, or Overdive Investigation Unit. Hyde dives right in, telling Aya to rally with the troops and take down the big orb. We are then introduced to Thelonious Cray. What a name! who mentions the babble. Computer Tech Man explains Aya can reprogram the past. Sure. By the way, his name is Dr. Blank. Hyde then interrupts and starts to sort of explain what Overdive is. Aya separating her soul from her body to dive into the past using the system. Don't worry, this thick-ass plot dump eventually evens out, but damn, it does go on heavy right off the bat. From visuals alone, we understand that Aya can possess bodies with her soul and assume control. I am assuming direct control. With this power, she can fight the invading creatures known as the Twisted. As to what they are, Aya and crew aren't quite sure, only that they need to be destroyed and that the Babel, the massive tentacle tower they created, has a big orb that needs to blow up in order to eradicate them. After lots of fighting, an exhausted Aya confronts a tough enemy, but is pulled out last minute as they completed their data gathering for this overdive system. Aya is seen sleeping in a cell block, her mind flipping through vague memories, her reaching for a gun while bloodied, a girl with a monster face, and then she wakes up. Hyde comes in just as Aya looks at her ring, clearly suffering from some sort of amnesia. Hyde reveals that the boss of the FBI branch of CTI is gone. Sounds like bad news, but Aya is now not under investigation anymore because of it. Yay? Hyde comforts a distraught Aya. He tells her she doesn't need to have a past to have a future. He seems strangely on point with Aya having amnesia. The cell door closes and we're off to our next mission. Twisted appear at Club Sacrifice mid-concert. On super-secret military orders, the local National Guard mobilized immediately to rescue the concert goers. This incident happened exactly one year ago. Aya enters the overdive system and arrives in a body of one of the concert goers. Hyde comes on the radio to remind her the mission objective, to find the Babel's core, aka the Big Orb. Suddenly, tentacles come out of some portals, sucking bodies in, violently reducing them to nothing, raining down blood on the fans, you know, fun stuff. Aya is flustered by the whole incident and is taken by one of the tentacles, but using her overdive ability, she removes herself from the girl's body she possessed and enters one of the National Guards, just in time to see the body she had been controlling get utterly destroyed. Aya fights a large Twisted and proceeds through the venue, eliminating more Twisted that turn up. Aya confronts a lone girl, only to have a mess of images from her dream distract her as a large earthquake happens. Hyde notes that the babble is changing. Aya pursues the lone girl and comes across an injured woman. Upon kneeling down and looking at her, Aya has a memory crop up where she's cradling a woman in her arms. Who this woman is, we don't know, but she seems nice. Aya name drops her as Gabrielle, and is then snapped out of her daydream by Hyde. She then sees the girl with the twisted monster face and races after her. Aya eventually comes to face the boss monster she fought earlier. Once that is dealt with, Aya finds the girl again who is identified by Blank as Emily Jefferson. She starts to talk with Aya, wanting to tell her about her dream and that she has to remember. Remember where everything started, time zero. Emily transforms into a boss twisted, and and upon defeat, Aya dives into her, seeing the girl floating and eventually breaks apart, giving her more information regarding her dream. Small hints. Very small hints.
Aya wakes up in a cell in the exact same time as before the mission. We're stuck in a loop, guys. This time, Hyde doesn't come in to tell her the same news about the branch. This time, he says Cray is dead. Oh, and he has a friend with him. Evil grinning shitface Hunter Owen. You couldn't make a more obviously evil smartass if you tried. Hunter pulls out his gun on Aya, and Hyde insists Aya recovers Cray from the past. Door closes. Signal next mission. Save Cray from three days ago, destroy Big Orb. Got it, Hyde. Some banter between everybody reveals that Hunter doesn't think the past can be changed. I mean, does seem crazy, but Aya and the gang will prove him wrong. When Aya asks who will replace Cray, Hyde calls in Gabrielle Monsini, and Aya is visibly distraught at seeing the woman she had memories of dying in her arms. But the mission is more important right now, so go! Aya does as she's told and assists the SWAT team, while also keeping in mind to save Cray and destroy the big orb. Eventually, Aya dives into the babble and finds a powerful twisted inside, floating in a golden energy mass with some random bodies hanging out in it too. <sighs> Once Aya successfully takes down the creature, the babble begins to sink and fall. Aya manages to overdive out before it disappears, finding an injured Cray. When Aya goes to contact Hyde, it's not his voice, it's Hunter's. He says they lost Gabrielle's signal and lures Aya away. Obviously, Hunter is a scheming asshole, leading Aya to a boss arena. Cut back to present day headquarters, where Hunter has gassed the other members of the CTI. Aya then hears a chattering come through and a giant hornet type twisted emerges to fight her. After weakening it and overdiving into it, Aya hears is Gabrielle. She then finishes the boss off and dives in again, urging Gabrielle to hurry out. Gabrielle refuses and starts to break away, much like that Emily girl. Back to Hunter, Gabrielle comes and points a gun at him. Unfortunately for her, Aya had destroyed her twisted body three days prior, and she vanishes from existence. Aya is rightfully feeling dejected, as everyone she cares about keeps dying. A voice comes forth and invokes more of Aya's memories. She then remembers Eve, her younger sister. She then sees Eve, but it's all an illusion. Suddenly, she's with a mysterious man who turns and recognizes her. When the man won't give Eve to her, Aya shoots a warning shot, but it does nothing as Eve vanishes. Confused and angry, Aya demands answers from the man, who says that Eve is dead and that her soul wanders. The man then promises to meet Aya at the babble in the red fog. Aya leaves her possessed body and asks who he is. He answers, Kyle. Madigan. Back to December 24th, 2013, at the 23rd hour. Aya wakes up, knowing that she's started a loop again. Hyde greets her with the same information he gave at the beginning of episode 1, the boss is gone, and the FBI branch they're part of is also gone. Thank God, we can avoid Hunter murdering everybody for no reason. Armed with new information, Aya requests some info regarding Kyle Madigan and Eve Brea. Hyde is confused upon hearing the name Eve, with Aya saying she's her younger sister. Seconds later, Hyde reveals he was feigning ignorance, and sees that Aya is regaining her memories. You finally remember where your home is. We start the new episode with video footage of people getting massacred by a new type of enemy not seen before. Cray is not happy with sending Aya to this slaughter, doubting her skills. Dr. Blank clarifies what they're looking at, saying that this triggered the growth of the Babbles, and that the core slash mother slash big orb slash queen has awakened. Cray pipes up again with his emotional rant, saying it's a suicide mission to send Aya. Things are serious now. After receiving information to meet up with Captain Danny Russo, Aya encounters a Reaper, one seen previously in the first mission that is both in invincible and capable of trapping and killing Aya instantly. I am beyond your comprehension. I am sovereign. Thankfully, this one is much more avoidable. As Aya progresses through the subway, Radio Comms mentions sightings of a little girl, later with descriptions of having a Twisted's face. The messages soon start to mention a mysterious man that is dodging the Twisted and disappeared ahead. Aya emerges from the rendezvous point and finds Eve within a red orb. Dr. Blank is shocked by this, saying that Aya is seeing the possibility of Eve's existence. Personally, I was as confused as Hyde is here. She's seeing the... possibility? 
Aya tries to coax Eve out, but finds Captain Russo emerge. Turns out, it's Cray! When he gazes upon Eve, he says it's Isabella, his deceased daughter. Perhaps he too is seeing the possibility of his daughter's existence. Cray goes cray cray and disappears from existence, similar to Gabrielle. When Aya dives, she finds a calm, level-headed Cray giving her advice. He tells her to go get Eve as family is all that matters. He then fades again from existence, speaking his daughter's name. Fade to present time. Cray starts to leave the world but looks out at a normal New York skyline and says that Aya did it, that she saved Manhattan. Blank runs to Cray but he breaks apart, disappearing for good. Blank then instantly doesn't remember why he ran onto the roof. Suddenly, there's the appearance of the babble in the background. Turns out Aya didn't save Manhattan. Not yet. Aya starts to gather more memories from that dream and returns to the red orb with Eve in it. Kyle materializes before her and before she's drawn back to the present day time, she tells him to help Eve before vanishing. Leave it to me. I'll save our little princess. Surprisingly, Aya doesn't return to December 24th, 2013. Instead, it's been two months since that day, bringing her to February 15th, 2014. New York is plagued by the Babbles, and the military are mobilizing to take back Manhattan before falling back to Plan B, nuke the damn place. Aya is seen watching a video of the news report that mentions that the North Shallows Tower, Babel, is the largest and keeps growing. It's safe to assume that this is probably the main tower. In a fun twist, we see Maeda has returned and is aiding Aya in her overdiving since the device was destroyed, along with Dr. Blank the day after the loop date. In this new base, Maeda serves as a fountain of information for the plot. Aya destroyed a Babel, but didn't make anything much better. Eve is a time paradox that she both exists and doesn't exist. The overdive device's core is made from Babel materials that are similar to Aya's cells. Kyle Madigan is Aya's ex-fiance, has Eve, and is hiding out in the North Shallows Tower. Apparently, Twisted attacked the CTI building and that Kyle Madigan was among them and destroyed the device. Also, they really cranked up the creepiness with Maeda for some reason. I never tire of seeing your exquisite overdive technique. Oh, oh. Aya dives into the soldiers retaking New York, utilizing tanks and whatnot to destroy the invading Twisted. The plan is to plant C4 bombs on supporting pillars throughout the main Babel Tower. When everything is set up, there's a hitch in the plan in that the soldiers Aya's been with have no way of escaping. Thankfully, a random helicopter crashes into the side of the Babel, allowing Aya to assume control of the helicopter pilot and escape while the rest unfortunately die. As Aya blasts her way around and up the tower, she finds Kyle Madigan on top of the tower. Aya asks just what the fuck he's doing, and he pulls the cool guy, you don't need to know. Not going to be fooled by the dude's charm, Aya shoots a warning shot, he starts to laugh maniacally, and then she shoots him for real, causing an explosion of light and Kyle's laughing twisted to emerge. After taking it down with the helicopters, Kyle seems to regain his consciousness as she dives into it. She finds Eve and more memories of the wedding day. The memory continues to show Aya shooting her sister, or did she? Maeda tunes in to say something's wrong with the Babel. Aya finds Kyle, who says the Twisted took over his body. He zones out a bit and says he's found eternity inside Aya. He then dies as the tower starts to shake violently. The tower explodes as the Babel emerges, causing catastrophic devastation that unites the tentacles into one massive tangled mess. It then gives off a beautiful white light and looks like a tree now. We then see Hyde Boar spouting off an evil monologue about how the doors to Zero have been opened before he walks into the entrance of the newly formed tower. The doors to zero have been opened. Right off the bat, Aya is stunned to learn that the Babel is an overdive system. Science is never wrong. Also cue more Maeda creepiness. I know it will. <laughs> How sweet your tears must taste. That's supposed to cheer me up? Maeda then claims that there is a new enemy that is trying to claim the newly named Grand Babel from the Twisted, an intelligent species that look like humans that Maeda has dubbed the High Ones. After some insane camera zoom, Aya spots Hyde before he enters the Grand Babel. Part 2 of Maeda's info dump. The High Ones are not related to the Twisted at all, and are fighting each other to survive. Turns out the Twisted were once people. They were taken over by the High Ones and became High Ones themselves. Bigger Babel can go into the past further, unlike the Overdive device, which was small. 
the Twisted have the ability to travel back in time. Aya comes to the conclusion that the Twisted are a mysterious life form from the far future that's clawing their way through the past. Hyde Bohr, Kyle Madigan, Gabrielle Monsini, and Emily Jefferson all interacted with each other and knew Aya, with Emily knowing Eve. Isabella, Cray's daughter, is revealed to have died in a car accident before the Babel existed. Despite massive amounts of Twisted rushing towards the Grand Babel, Aya is determined to go after Hyde. I'm coming for you, Hyde. I owe you. I'm Special Agent Aya Brea of the CTI. And my final mission? is about to begin. After loads of enemies and finally sticking it to that invincible reaper, Aya finds Hyde under a swirling vortex of energy. Hyde's evil monologue tells that he's been stuck in a loop too, and has been keeping the Twisted at bay. Whenever he dies, he wakes up to repeat the loop all over again. But now it's different. The cycle will be broken! Aya asks why she was told to fight the High Ones. Hyde says that each time one of them dies, the babble gets stronger, and because of that, he has gained access to the doors to zero. Fight time! After finishing Hyde off, Aya regains more of the wedding day memories, confirming that Aya shot Eve in order to prevent the awakening of Eve, the mother, the queen, the big orb. Hyde explains that the High Ones originated when Eve awakened, and her memories were inherited by these High Ones. Aya is desperate to dive back to that time and fix it. Hyde reveals that she isn't the only one who can overdive and activates the door to zero. It is time to go to Eve. Aya is left floating in the Golden Vortex with the Queen, aka Awakened Eve. As Aya dives into her and accesses the Vortex inside the Queen, she finds Hyde in New York, ready for the almost final showdown. Aya enters a darker void than most, finding a swirling collection of red liquid that activates when she gets close. Inside is a blue twisted, aka Hyde's final form. After wasting the asshole, she defeats him once and for all, unlocking Time Zero, the place where eternity begins. Turns out Time Zero is that wedding memory Aya keeps dreaming about. You see Gabrielle, Cray, and Emily outside the church while Aya, Kyle, Hyde, and Eve are inside. Suddenly a SWAT team emerge to gun down everybody attending the ceremony. As Aya gets shot down dramatically, Aya and Eve start to glow blue. And then Aya takes out the whole SWAT team before looking at Eve who collapses on the floor. And with that, we learn that Eve's soul was inside Aya's body this whole time. Hyde was apparently hiding inside of Eve to appear and explain the big plot twist to Eve. She was desperate to save Aya and moved her soul into Aya's body, destroying Aya's soul in the process. Turns out Aya's soul was scattered throughout time and space, somehow, returning to the present day as the Twisted for some reason. Eve's body then gave birth to the High Ones, somehow, which explains why they have her memories. Time Zero is the start of all of this nonsense. You two were the cause of the birth of two new species, and that is Time Zero. Hyde plans to destroy Eve's body, with her proper soul in place to change the cycle. But before he can enact his insane plan, he is shot by Aya, who, surprise, turns out to be alive with her soul intact. Sass and all. Well, it's already been destroyed. <laughs> Sweet dreams. However, not everything can end happily. In order to prevent the Twisted and High Ones from existing, Aya tells Eve to shoot her. Distraught, Eve starts to make the overdive waves, and Aya hugs her. They switch bodies so that Aya's soul is in Eve's body, and vice versa. Since Aya's soul dies, it cannot make the Twisted, and with Eve's body dead, it cannot make the High Ones. Everything is solved, and Eve is eternally sad. Kyle starts talking to Aya, who is now actually Eve, but responds like Aya. A new timeline is created where the wedding is now taking place. SWAT team free. Before it gets too weird, where Eve in Aya's body marries Kyle, he senses that she's Eve and leaves, confusing the shit out of the priest as he takes Eve's ring and goes to find Eternity, aka Aya, leaving Eve to decide her own future. But before he leaves, he tells her, One more thing. Happy birthday. Sometime in the future, we see Eve wandering New York as snow starts to fall. As she's admiring it, a woman, who is totally Aya, walks past saying, Happy birthday. It's your fourth. What the hell is that? The 
prominent theme you see through all of the games, yes, even the third birthday, is evolution. In the first two games, evolution is spurred on through mitochondria within cells, having them communicate and take over the body, resulting in horrific mutations. In the third game, it's about the high ones wanting to create a new species with a complete Eve, aka Eve's soul in Eve's body. No matter which game it is, the matter of evolving into an improved species is always refused by the protagonists. Is it because the proposed evolution is forced and not naturally occurring? We're not exactly sure, though in Parasite Eve 1 we learn at the end of the game that Aya had inherited Maya's cornea and her mitochondria evolved over the years and helped her overcome Eve's influence. This symbiotic relationship is much more beneficial to Aya and might be the way for humanity, if it simply evolved gradually. The forced evolution we see is fairly unstable and creates monsters more times than not. Well, it seems to create monsters 100% of the time. In the third birthday, the High Ones are technically monsters but hold humanoid forms, which makes it a slightly more reasonable argument towards evolution, though what would result from creating a new species of High Ones remains a mystery. We never get to see what they look like. In Parasite Eve 2, the push to evolve isn't to fulfill mitochondrial Eves or some higher being's plan, but to introduce a new food chain and revitalize human growth, one where humans don't dominate and have something that will hunt them down to keep them on edge. This all comes from humanity having those feel-good bozos talking about risks, peace, and equality, and those who manipulate others to benefit themselves. Basically, what Kyle is saying is he wants the weak, greedy assholes to get killed while the strong, smart people, aka people like Kyle, get to earn their spot in the human-dominated world. I know, the logic isn't really sound and seems very childish, but there's a little bit of the next theme tucked inside his random thoughts. At the end of Parasite Eve, Maeda really hits this theme on the head with his misanthropic attitude towards people by comparing humanity to a cancerous parasite who are killing the planet, the environment, and animals. Starting with the incident in Japan and now with this, I wonder if this is a message to all mankind. If the Earth is a single human being, we humans that invade the Earth become like viruses out of control. We, in essence, are upsetting the natural balance of the body. This is definitely utter destruction. You see, humans are, in essence, parasites. You can say that we are parasites and the world is our host. This is slightly touched upon in Parasite Eve 2, with the whole humans dominating too hard, that it's unhealthy, we're killing ourselves, etc, etc. Which can indirectly mean that humans are slowly killing the planet, which is completely true with global warming at the moment, but is the solution to create neo-mitochondrial creatures to eat weaker humans? Probably not. Seems like a lot of extra work, when there are other ways to even out the playing field. The plot of Third Birthday does a great job at cutting down the human race by killing 3 million people with the appearance of the Babbles and Twisted. Could they be saving the planet from the future? Probably not. Just so I've covered everything, Third Birthday doesn't mention anything about the environment or the planet or how humanity treats it. Nothing. Just future space aliens. Humanity is seen both as a driving force and a problem in these games. In one, humanity is taking advantage of the planet they live on, wasting their lives when it could be improved by a short, painful awakening to mitochondria living inside them. With two, humanity doesn't deserve to live a carefree life, they must earn it or die. Lastly, with three, humanity needs to evolve for reasons? Another take on the theme of humanity comes in the form of bonds and family. As we follow Aya and Eve in their adventures, we notice that they have lots of people surrounding them and supporting them along the way. In one, there's Daniel and Aya's police crew. In two, we got Pierce, who is totally in love with Aya, but she friendzones him super hard. We also have Douglas, Flint, Jody, a bunch of people. The third birthday, Eve is being encouraged by everyone who became High Ones at the Time Zero event. Basically, what I'm saying is that our protagonists had help. They had friends and family, so the message could be that facing things alone is reckless. By working together, it gives humanity a chance at fighting the uprising mitochondria, subduing the ANMCs, or recovering one's memory to prevent a disaster from unfolding. Even in the book slash film, when one character is working alone like Toshiaki, it's detrimental to him and those around him. Mariko Anzai's dad was never around and only working, straining their relationship to near breaking point. But when they reach out for help, that's when things start to shift in the right direction as they confront the selfish villain that is Eve.
The theme of identity is prevalent throughout the series with the question of what am I or who am I popping up quite a bit. At the beginning of Parasite Eve, Aya has a solid grip on who she is and what she does, but that starts to fall apart after the encounter with Eve at the opera. Because of her survivability, she begins to question who she really is, that she might be a monster like Eve, just a bit different. Later on, she builds up her confidence again, finding answers that draw her away from the conclusion that she's just like Eve, with help from Daniel and Maeda, developing a new identity in the process. When we get into Parasite Eve 2, it's not much about Aya who needs the question of who she is answered, although she did have a very close meltdown when she realized the ANMCs were made from her sample, but the question of identity comes in the form of Eve. Who is she really? An Aya clone? Her own entity? Is she a monster? Was it the organization influencing this identity? We can pull Aya back into this mix a bit in that her identity changes in what role she takes on for Eve. They become family. This new dynamic definitely changes Aya when you see her briefly in Third Birthday. Speaking of the third game, it's safe to say that identity is the central theme. Eve believes she's Aya right up until the end where everything is revealed. Eve has to struggle with the fact that she's not Aya, but also she possesses Aya's body, a form almost 15 years older than her original self. It's kind of ironic how a clone of Aya in Parasite Eve 2 then becomes her in the closest possible sense, as I assume Eve uses all of Aya's documentation and whatnot. Unfortunately, we as the players are kind of left to imagine how Eve copes with this new life, seeing as it's both her own, but that she's also wearing the mask of Aya. It's unique, and I would have been quite invested in the story had it been expanded at the end. I have come here to graciously offer myself to the mother. It's pretty obvious that these Parasite Eves hold heavy motherhood vibes. Both the novel and the first game are all about birthing the ultimate being. The story on Eve's side revolving around getting pregnant and birth. The lovely and painful experience mothers get to have. Hooray! Unfortunately, the motherhood aspect is very short-lived in both stories, where Eve disintegrates but allows the offspring to live on and evolve rapidly, only to either melt or get blown up by a ship. In Third Birthday, Eve is technically the mother of all High Ones, well, her soulless body is. As strange and weird as it is, Eve is the origin which is interpreted as the mother thanks to Hyde, though motherhood itself isn't exactly right for this situation. In Parasite Eve 2, there isn't much in the way of motherhood, but more in the way of the connection between Aya and Eve. While technically Eve is a clone, there are some tender moments where Aya acts motherly towards her, but due to age closeness, they settled for a younger sister. Which makes sense, especially when you're trying to get away with sneaking Eve out of a deadly organization. start tackling the theories and connections between the three games. I'll come out and say the obvious that yes, all three games are fully connected stories. I think we can all agree on that. Even though the wiki page is eager to call Third Birthday a spin-off, but also calling it the third entry. Make up your mind. While there are a number of theories that have cropped up while players push through the games, there are definitely a lot of questions with no solid answers attached to them. Why does Kyle go to the North Shallows Tower? How does Daniel drive so goddamn fast? How did Aya's soul create the Twisted? Why do random SWAT officers appear in the church and shoot Aya and Kyle? Why and how do the Babbles exist? When did they exist? Why are they underground? Why do they appear at once? Why do they merge into the Grand Babel after Kyle's death? Why and how does defeating a High One cause a new timeline? Why does it cause Aya to ascend back to the present time? Why was Kyle working for the President of the United States? How did scientists get a sample of Aya to make ANMCs. Why are the High Ones born from Eve's body? Why does defeating all High Ones open a time portal to time zero? Why is Cray's daughter suddenly alive in the new timeline when Isabella died in 2006, four years before the history of warping in 2010? Ignoring the mess that mostly came from Third Birthday's headache-inducing story, I will tackle some of the more popular theories from the games, going in chronological order. Mariko Anzai is not Mariko Brea. In order to back this up, we have a number of points that help us identify the falseness of this claim. 
For starters, the book references Canon Wilson's theory on Mitochondrial Eve, a paper that was published in 1987. Later on, Sachiko Asakura mentions an experiment involving mice and mitochondrial DNA being passed from the father. She talks about this at the end of the book, stating that the experiment took place in 1991. Her master's degree took two years to complete, so at the earliest, the novel story takes place in 1989. Armed with this information, if the book was in 1989 and Mariko Anzai is said to be 14 in the book, this would make her birth year 1975. Aya Brea is 25 in Parasite Eve, which takes place in 1997 on Christmas Eve. This makes her birth year 1972. Can you see the problem here? Through files in the game, we learn that Mariko and Maya died in a car accident in 1977. Mariko couldn't have been the same one in the book, have a 25-year-old daughter before she was born, and died at age 2 with her other daughter Maya. So we can conclude that this theory is false. Mariko Brea is likely a reference to the character in the book, like an Easter egg, if you will. At the end of Parasite Eve, we are at the opera where it all began. We zoom into Aya's eye, where the presence of Eve's mitochondria can be seen. The music picks up, and doesn't exactly sound inviting. We then see Daniel's eyes change to a purplish red along with Maeda. Aya stands up as the eyes of the crowd start to glow. We fade to black, and are left wondering what went down. There are two ways one can interpret this ending. One is that Eve lives on and can spread her influence once again, awakening the mitochondria within the crowd and sowing the seeds of future outbreaks. Due to the ominous feel of the ending, it certainly seems like that is what the game is implying. But there's loads of evidence for the second interpretation, which is that Aya is using her abilities to quell the mitochondria and prevent an uprising that would create monsters, and for Eve to be reborn. Basically, Aya is giving them a vaccine to fight against the virus that is Eve. So where's the evidence? We all learned from Maeda's experiment that Aya's mitochondria rebelled against Eve's, protecting the nuclei from being turned. If Eve had the ability to make people's cells communicate with one another, what says Aya can't do the same? When Eve cast her influence over people, it resulted in a crowd erupting into flames. When Aya stands up and the purplish red eyes start, we don't see any violent flames exploding. Instead, we listen to the opera singer's aria fade until the screen turns black. Now we know in Parasite Eve 2, there is still a problem with neo-mitochondrial creatures but none of them are humans. Those who are human in the game were volunteers in the experiment to achieve an evolved form and have microtransmitters controlling them. If you're still not convinced, how about this? On the original soundtrack track listing, you can see the familiar titles of Resonance, Fusion, Selection, Conception, Liberation, Evolution, and the last one not given a proper title card, Symbiosis. This contains the songs played in the post-game scene only, showing that the last day in the game is called Symbiosis. For a quick reminder as to what that means, it's interaction between two different organisms living in close physical association, typically to the advantage of both. In other words, Aya's mitochondria and Eve's influence are working together with the host, aka Aya, in a mutually beneficial relationship. As messy as this game is, it has some questions that could have solid answers. I'll try my best with this one and the next one. So why did Kyle destroy the overdive device and murder everybody at CTI? There are two possibilities. One, Kyle was possessed by a high one, as when you meet him, he says he was being controlled by a twisted. Two, Maeda mentions this in a message in the inbox that Kyle probably didn't like Aya diving around in the past, which could be true, but doesn't explain why he murdered everyone in CTI. Perhaps to prevent any chance at rebuilding the thing? Knowledge spreading and allowing another one to crop up somewhere? Even with these two theories, it's impossible to confirm nor deny them fully, as the game is infamous for leaving loose plot threads. Speaking of unexplained story parts... One of the biggest questions regarding the whole game, why did the SWAT officers appear in the church? They're the ones who started this whole mess, and yet there is little to no information as to why they came to crash the wedding and murder everybody inside. Seems like it would be an important point to address, but hey, they didn't. 
So what can we pull from nothing? Well, the aftermath of Parasite Eve 2 could possibly shed some light onto this sudden SWAT team invasion. At the end of the game, when the President of the United States is speaking with his staff member, he mentions that the mole they hired, aka Kyle Madigan, knew too much and that he would be pretty dangerous being left alone. There's also the fact that Eve is an illegal clone of Aya and yet through FBI magic, Aya was able to have Eve become her younger sister. Something that the government probably wouldn't have liked, seeing as she could control A and MCs and would have latent mitochondrial powers. That brings us to Aya. She knows just as much as Kyle, has been involved in two major fuck-ups, and has a personal connection with the original Eve in Parasite Eve 1. All of that is probably enough to set off a number of alarm bells. The only strange part about this theory is why did it take them nearly a decade to finally do the deed and kill them off? By then, the president in Parasite Eve 2 would have been out of office and someone else would be in charge. Perhaps it was an important document needing to be addressed and it was just left until now? It still seems strange that the government would do such a drastic move. It seems that Aya, Eve, and Kyle weren't exactly afraid of the government's reprisal for their involvement in those missions. Aya and Eve freely went to museums, as seen at the end of 2, and the fact that they're having a wedding in a cathedral screams that they're not living underground. It could also be that the government actually wants Eve to take over and evolve humanity. Maybe they want that power to emerge, but Aya and crew are a hindrance that always prevent that from happening. That's probably not the case, but when there aren't any hints as to what the answer might actually be, you have to pull ideas from every angle. First off, I'm going to say that no, I am not a biologist, and therefore my explanations will be basic so that both you and I understand what's being said. I took biology classes ages ago and only remember a few random things like if your DNA was uncoiled, it could travel to Pluto and back, and that 25% of adult bones are in your feet. Shit like that. Now that you understand that I am a regular ass human trying to explain complex biological information, let's tackle this monster of a topic piece by piece. First off, let's refresh our brains about what mitochondria is. Mitochondria are mighty, microscopic, energy-producing structures that are essential to our health. These organelles, specialized structures within a cell performing specific functions, live within almost every cell in our bodies. Mitochondria are responsible for creating more than 90% of the energy needed to sustain life and support organ function. They're like tiny factories in each of our cells that turn the food we eat and the oxygen we breathe into energy, our body's major energy source. Source. We cannot survive without them. Now that we have a basic understanding of what we're looking at, let's tackle some of these science statements from Dr. Hans Klamp and Eve herself from Parasite Eve. Mitochondria is multifunctional. There are a number of functions mitochondria can perform. The production of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. This is our energy source for cells. Mitochondria consumes 85 to 90% of oxygen in cells to allow a process called oxidative phosphorylation, oxphos, which is the prime pathway to produce ATP. Calcium homeostasis, the exchange of calcium in the mitochondria. It is very important for metabolic regulation and cell death. Mitochondria regulates natural immunity. Mitochondrial antiviral signaling proteins help induce antiviral and anti-inflammatory pathways. Cell death. Mitochondria aid in apoptosis, the process of cell death by controlling the pathway, releasing proteins in response to cell stresses. These include heat, infection, hypoxia, which is oxygen deprivation, increased calcium and nutrient deprivation. Stem cells. Mitochondria are believed to help with maintenance and reprogramming of stem cells that are capable of developing into several different types of cells. Mitochondria has its own unique genetic code. This is true. Mitochondria have their own DNA, which is neat because all other organelles do not have their own and technically shouldn't need to have their own DNA. Your own cells supply all of the code necessary for things to work properly. Interestingly enough, when scientists took a closer peek at mitochondrial DNA, they found it resembled bacterial DNA and not the usual cellular DNA that is nicely fit together, whereas bacterial DNA usually just floats around freely. This leads us to our second point from Clamp. Clamp claims it is a separate organism. As you can see from this simple diagram, the original building blocks of our mitochondria was an outside entity and not created by the cell originally. This explains why mitochondria possess their own unique DNA since eons ago, it was its own thing. So does this mean that Eve's claims of mitochondria being able to rebel and rise up could be possible? Unfortunately, no. Since cells inherited mitochondria like billions of years ago, the mitochondria itself has lost a lot of the genome it originally possessed and transferred it to the host cell nucleus. 
nucleus. It's gotten so comfortable in our cells that it cannot survive without the constant supply of biomolecules and the safe environment provided by the host cell. Think of it like your pet dog or cat. Sure, ages ago they were wild and could fend for themselves, but now that we've domesticated them, they've more or less become reliant on us for many everyday things. That definitely rings true for my cats who wouldn't be able to survive outside for more than a day. Another point Eve puts forward is that mitochondria have been scheming within the cell and hoping to eventually take over the body. The theory of endosymbiosis kind of supports this idea, where a separate organism with a will of its own enters the cell and becomes an organelle. Like how the previous diagram illustrates, the idea is hampered by the previous point in that it has become dependent on the cell for basic functions. In the end, mitochondria cannot function on their own anymore and therefore could not take over the body. Humans cannot live without mitochondria. It creates energy. I mean, true, this is 100% true, so it does a lot of things, so yes. <laughs> Mitochondria is capable of discharging 200,000 volts of electricity. Please keep in mind that volts are the potential and doesn't mean the power or energy. Now, this one is tricky to explain in plain speech. I read through some intense documents and came to the conclusion that yes, mitochondria can produce over 200,000 volts, as stated in this complex series of calculations from a scientific paper. At the same time, it is well recognized that membrane potential of inner mitochondrial membrane IMM, is tilde minus 180 millivolts MV. However, when compared to the electric potential potential of plasma membrane tilde minus 70 millivolts. Mitochondrial membrane seems to be a better capacitor in storing charge. To further signify the effectiveness of mitochondrial membrane potential, psi mito, we can precisely calculate the charge stored by these cellular capacitors. It is known that the IMM is approximately 7, 0 nanometers thick, thus the voltage gradient across the IMM is 0, 180 volts per 7, 0 times 10 minus 7 centimeters. This is equivalent to 257, 142, 90 volts per centimeter, which is significantly higher than high voltage transmission electricity supply lines employing voltage gradient of about 200, 000 V per kilometer and higher to the plasma membrane voltage gradient of 200 000 V per centimeter as well. Majority of the membrane potential across the mitochondrial inner membrane is generated by proton transport which is directly coupled with ATP production. Again, it must be made clear that voltage is the difference in electric potential energy per unit charge. In the simplest way I can explain that in my very unscientific brain is this. Voltage measures the difference between two points, like point A and point B, and how much potential energy a unit charge would have at A and how much potential energy it would have at B. You have to have two points as measuring voltage from a single point is, well, useless. It's not what it's designed to measure. So, approximately how many mitochondrial cells are in the human body? About 10 million billion or 100,000 trillion? The mitochondria make this voltage energy by making ATP, which is regulated by the nuclei. There are lots of things in place to prevent things from going catastrophically wrong. There are ion channels that carry this energy, but it doesn't overload with 200,000 volts. It regulates it. Just like traffic narrowing from three lanes to one, shoving it in all at once will cause destruction and chaos. There is also a potential loss of energy while it's traveling around. Inside the mitochondria itself are proteins that line the cristae that act as electrical insulators, which in turn also regulates the electrical current by lowering it significantly to stopping the electrical current altogether. Pair all of this with the fact that energy created from mitochondria helps run your entire body. With these in place, it prevents ourselves from erupting with electrical energy and killing themselves off. Clamp then mentions heat energy. It's true the mitochondria produce the most human body heat due to the fact that they control your metabolism by regulating intracellular energy production, aka ATP generation and consumption. In a university article which measured mitochondria heat using tiny thermometers, they say that producing heat is part of mitochondria's role in the center of metabolism activity. It needs to produce the energy currency that's used for the activities in the cell. And heat is one of the byproducts, in most cases. But there is a mechanism that can ramp this process up up to produce more heat when the body needs it. That's what fat cells do when they're in need of heat when the body's temperature goes down. So yes, heat energy is a byproduct of mitochondria producing the energy we need. Can it override itself and melt somebody? Well, let's move on to the next point. Mitochondria running at full could melt someone. In the game, it's explained that since ATP production shoots up, it produces more heat. Therefore, it would melt someone into a puddle of goo. There are a number of facts that go against this fantastical conclusion. Mitochondria would have to communicate with one another for even the slightest chance at spontaneously combusting someone. Unfortunately for mitochondria, they're locked in their own cells and cannot possibly unite all mitochondria to explode with heat. As we learned a few points ago, mitochondria aren't intelligent, free-thinking organelles despite their origins as an aerobic prokaryote that wiggles its way into the cell. There is no way it could initiate complex communication lines with other cells. 
Also, yes, mitochondria produce ATP, but they don't regulate it themselves. That's the job of the nucleus, something Eve is quite salty about in the book, arguing with the professor that claimed mitochondria were slaves to the nucleus. So what if mitochondria had a chance at organizing themselves to melt their host? Well, unfortunately for them, our bodies are designed to regulate heat, in that our bodies are largely made of water, which is a massive hurdle to overcome as it acts like a heat sink and will absorb most of the heat energy produced by mitochondria. Mitochondria has control over an organism's growth. As we are well aware, mitochondria is the main producer of ATP, which provides energy to just about everything. But we also know from the first section that it has multiple functions. Well, guess what? There are more to help regulate growth. Examples include making certain types of hormones, they help drive immunity responses, they can help shape the development of cells, plus many, many more that you can go look up. They do tons of stuff. Mitochondria DNA can mutate 10 times faster than normal cells. This statement is true. Mitochondria DNA, or mtDNA as we're gonna call it from now on, are subject to damage from reactive oxygen molecules released as a byproduct during oxidative phosphorylation, oxphos, or in more simple terms, when ATP is made from the transfer of electrons. Since the organelle's internal environment is involved with a highly reactive process, the DNA doesn't have time to build up defenses, opting for higher mutations to keep up. In addition, the mtDNA also has a less efficient DNA repair mechanism than, say, ones found in the nucleus. Since the beginning of creation, the mitochondria has been evolving at this rate. From facts pointed out before, we can see that mitochondria has become entirely dependent on the cell environment and cannot really evolve unless the whole cell was on board. Originally, mitochondria arose once in evolution with the whole endosymbiosis thing, but that's the only known time when a type of evolution took place. It's been too ingrained in our bodies to ever break away and evolve on their own. Mitochondrial Eve In the game, Clamp claims that Mitochondrial Eve originated from a single African woman, which, if you read through the theory, does not say that. It actually states that all current human mitochondrial DNA came from a community of people in Africa between 140,000 to 200,000 years ago. The published paper has some problems with the dates and what they're focusing on, and the fact that they only took information from the women. The theory claimed that mitochondrial DNA was only inherited from the mother, yet studies later on, as stated in the book's epilogue, there were scientists disproving the strictly maternal inheritance, showing that paternal mtDNA were present as well. When offspring inherit nuclear DNA, or DNA in the nuclei of cells, they receive half of that DNA from their mother's egg cell and half from their father's sperm cell, a process called recombination. The mtDNA genome passes entirely from the mother to offspring, differing only in minor random changes, called mutations, to the mtDNA sequence. Offspring inherit mtDNA only from their mothers. There is no mixing of maternal and paternal genes in the mtDNA sequence. Mammalian females have multiple copies of identical mtDNA molecules. The authors propose that mtDNA passes from mother to offspring without mixing together and therefore is more sensitive to change across generations, in small populations that expand rapidly to form a large population. The results presented in this paper provide clear and provocative evidence for the biparental transmission of mtDNA in three separate, multi-generation families as confirmed by two independent laboratories. Clearly, these results will need to be brought in agreement with the fact that maternal inheritance remains absolutely dominant on an evolutionary timescale, and that occasional paternal transmission events seem to have left no detectable mark on the human genetic record. It's funny to note that the authors of the mitochondrial Eve theory actually didn't give the name Eve at all. That was some other scientist who made the headline, Unmasking of Mitochondrial Eve. I mean, the biblical connection makes sense in that it's talking about the mother of mitochondria, but another scientist published one called Out of the Garden of Eden, strengthening the hold of the name Eve. Humans just served as transportation vehicles to transport us to the time the mitochondria would become free again. But you see, the vehicle is no longer needed anymore. From now on, the mitochondria will become human beings and will rule this earth. Now after all we've learned, how stupid does this statement sound that Eve says in the game? Mitochondria are not capable of much and are entirely dependent on the cells. So it's safe to say we're going to continue being in charge of these things and that our vehicle status is now their life support. Hooray, we've made it to the fun facts section. Let's just dive right in and I'll provide the links when appropriate. There is an electronic rock song from 2020 that was inspired by the game. It's called Parasite Eve and it's by Bring Me the Horizon. It's pretty good. In the Japanese version of Parasite Eve, Liberation and Evolution Day titles are swapped, with Liberation being Day 5 and Evolution being Day 6. Why? Honestly, there is no solid answer I could find. It's just the way it is. 
So this next point, I'm piecing together stuff, so it might be total shit. The fact that Aya called her car Carrie in Parasite Eve 2 makes me think it was some sort of reference to the Stephen King novel of the same game. Now, he wrote a book called Christine, which is about a possessed car. But as I was looking up the car scene in Carrie and looked up what car was involved, it kind of looks similar to what Aya had. It could be one of these two cars. Parasite Eve was developed in California with Japanese collaboration. Parasite Eve was Square's first M-rated game due to its disturbing imagery, body horror, sexual themes, and violence. As mentioned briefly in my summary of Parasite Eve 2, you can find a pinball machine referencing the game Einhander. And as you may have noticed, throughout my playthrough I had the gun blade from Final Fantasy VIII, which can be unlocked after doing some crazy skilled shit, which I did not do. I took a save file. In Parasite Eve 1, the dome displaying Aya's attack range during combat Combat is a Pentaka Psycho Zedodecahedron. The game Third Birthday was originally developed for mobile phones, but it was later changed to the PSP, which apparently improved on the game, but I don't think so. Hideaki Sena, the author of the Parasite Eve book, approved of the first game, stating that he was actually impressed how well the game makers translated the novel. The logo font for Parasite Eve is Futura BT. When Aya parachutes to fight Eve in Parasite Eve 1, instead of a smirk on Eve's face, it was supposed to be anger and rage, as seen in some early and quite blurred storyboard pages. While I did like the snarky Eve character, it would have been interesting to see her angry as all hell in the final moments. Remember the shower scene in Parasite Eve 2? Well, they ramp it up in Third Birthday to the point where you feel horribly awkward just listening to it, as it comes complete with moaning sounds for some reason. That's not good. <laughs> what can I say about the Parasite Eve series as a whole? It started off strong with the original game, then it opted to be more like the mainstream games, like Resident Evil in Parasite Eve 2, which sort of shot itself in the foot but didn't ruin the series. And then it ended with the series nosediving into an aneurysm-inducing plot that made you kill off the most beloved character of the whole franchise. Way to go, third birthday. The book and film serve as a prequel of sorts, more so a warm-up about the details regarding why Eve exists and does what she does. The book can be rough at times, what with the author being a pharmacologist, where tons of information that is probably natural to him is thrown at unsuspecting readers who have no idea what the donation processes are and culturing cells. Speaking of overly complicated science, I understand that perhaps some things in the science section aren't entirely accurate, and I fully admit I am not science oriented at all. I wish I was, but I'm not. If there are any mistakes, please point them out so I can pin them in the comment section for everyone to readily view. I do these videos entirely on my own, and if I did draw upon the knowledge of friends, I don't think they'd know much more than I do. I really need to make more scientist friends. I hope you enjoyed the game analysis. It took way longer than I expected it to take, which is something I regularly underestimate. Please let me know what series you would like to see on my channel, preferably something that doesn't have a massive collection of games. If you ask me to do the Tales series, there's no way. It's too big. Thank you for tuning in, and I really hope you enjoyed the video. But only a few ANMCAs. And what the? But only a few NM. ANMCs. All of the NNM. <laughs> ANMCs. Which can control the other NAM. Fuck, I hate this. I hate this abbreviation. <laughs> <gasps>